I grew up in graveyards. The dead were my babysitters, my quiet companions. Not silent though, they announced themselves with great formality. You only had to read the stones. Here lays the corpse of Mary Dickey, who died December the 18th, 1740, aged three years and nine months. Suffer the little children to come unto me. That's one I remember from the old town cemetery in Stirling. I would spend whole summers there, a littlest child myself, trying to catch tadpoles, those living commas, in the small pond called the Pithy Mary, or taking a poke of penny sweets up onto the Ladies Rock, a steep outcrop in the centre of the cemetery, where one could enjoy flying saucers and foam shrimps while looking out over the panorama of graves. Those graves, laid out in rows, they were shelves full of stories. I was a shy boy, wary, watchful, living inside myself, living in books. Treasure Island, the hound of the Baskervilles, adventurous from an earlier age. Headstones in that company were just more tales. I would wander among the headstones, reading the inscriptions, gopping at the 18th century carvings, poking a soft finger into the socket of a stone skull, or into the pits left by musket balls in the walls of the medieval church. And if the imagination is a muscle, graveyards are a gym. I would look at the names and wonder, did John Barnes, hairdresser, who died aged 67 in January 1891, ever in his youth take comb and scissors to Ebenezer Gentleman, who died at Christmas 1868, and whose crooked stone lies just a step or two away? You know, it never felt frightening to be surrounded by dead people. In those days, the late 70s, early 80s, the living seemed much more of a threat. The cemetery was in poor repair, lots of vandalism. Worst of all was a monument to a pair of women, Margaret McLaughlin and Margaret Wilson, who had been put to death here in Wigton in 1685 for refusing to give up their Protestant religion. They had been tied to stakes and drowned in the rising tide of the Solway Firth. This is their grave, just right here. Now in Stirling, they had suffered a second martyrdom, the glass of their memorial smashed, the heads and hands of the marble statues broken off and stolen. Who would do that? The sad truth is, it could have been anyone. The cemetery was haunted by ne'er-do-wells, junkies, punk dafties, solvent huffers with fairy rings of plukes around chafed lips. I lived in mortal fear of a lad known as Tommy Glowbag, who was rumoured to have inhaled so much solvent that a pouch of the stuff had mushroomed on the back of his head, pushing tight and milky through his short ginger hair. Nobody wanted it to get close enough to verify this. Tommy had a reputation for recreational violence. One day, while I was playing alone on the ladies' rock, he saw me and began cursing to climb. But his legs were rubbery beneath him, and about halfway up, he became, rather appropriately for a glue sniffer, stuck. Still, it was a bad moment. I felt like Jim Hawkins in the rigging, looking down in terror as Israel hands climbed dagger and teeth towards him. That was the thing about graveyards though. They felt like, and they feel like, treasure houses of stories. Some of those stories are international bestsellers. George Eliot and George Michael in Highgate. Oscar Wilde and Jim Morrison in Pearl Lachaise. Others, though, are known only locally, if at all. This book, like the best sort of funeral, will be a celebration, not a lament. It will uncover the stories and the glories of the best graveyards, from grand city cemeteries to elegiac country churchyards. I love 
all these places. I love the bones of them. I want to make you love them too.